All right, we looks like we're starting to stabilize on attendees. So let's go ahead and get started. Thanks everyone for joining us today. I'm Sarah Converse, uh, an associate professor in the School of Environment and Forest Sciences and the School of Aquatic and Fishery Sciences at University of Washington. And I am the unit leader of the USGS Washington Cooperative Fish and Life Research Unit. I'm really pleased um, to have Aliyah Deach with us today. Aliyah is a candidate for the position of Assistant Unit Leader Wildlife in the Washington Cooperative Fish and Wildlife Research Unit um, and a candidate for a faculty position in the School of Environmental and Forest Sciences. So um, Aliyah is currently an assistant professor in the School of Environment and Natural Resources at The Ohio State University. She primarily applies social psychological theories and methods to investigate the multi-level processes that affect conservation decision making and behavior in the context of wildlife management, carnivore conservation, human nature connections, recreation management on public lands, non-compliance, and backlash associated with a changing society. Two of her largest projects to date have informed management efforts in all 50 states and on federal public lands. Aliyah and her team are additionally committed to justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion efforts that honor diverse perspectives and improve outcomes for all. And today she is going to be talking to us about uh, context matters, understanding what shapes human thought and behaviors can improve conservation outcomes. Okay, Aliyah, thank you. I think you can take it away. Great. Well, thank you, Sarah. I appreciate the introduction and um, definitely thank all of you for the opportunity to share with you about some of my research. So it's certainly hard to try to capture all of that and what may feel like a long time as an attendee, but a short time from a presenter perspective just to capture all the um, different elements of my work. So I hope to also have the opportunity to engage with you all either one on one or through subsequent meetings as well. So in the context of my work, I also just want to identify that some about who I am is also important. Oops. There we go. Now I can change slides. So I do want to start with a tiny bit of background about some of the experiences that I've also had, because I think when we're talking about context matters, it helps to understand a little bit more about myself. So after my undergraduate experience and prior to going into grad school, I worked a variety of different um, positions over a course of four years that really helped me to think about why it is that we do what we do as humans. Um, you know, why do we prioritize certain species? So I worked for two years, for instance, as a wildlife biologist with peninsular bighorn sheep and um, also worked with um, recognized, or on federal public lands, particularly with the US Forest Service. So I worked both on the Flathead National Forest in Montana, as well as in the Deschutes National Forest in Oregon, and then also worked as a wilderness um, therapist instructor for, um, as largely in the Cascades region of Oregon, but also worked on the high desert plains and upwards up into Yakima, uh, Washington as well. So just recognizing that in these different capacities, again, just going back to this question of kind of, you know, why do humans do what they do? So even though in many cases I was working, say, on the wildlife biologist side of doing mortality, um, telemetry, you know, checking on how the species are moving or maybe not moving to different habitat types, um, it often came down to human decisions about when we might close certain trails because of recreation behavior. Um, it mattered, you know, who the partnerships that we had in terms of working across state and federal partners and nonprofit organizations. So I just, you know, I share this because these experiences really helped to shape um, why I went into grad school and ultimately went through the career path that I'm currently on. So I have about, you know, 15 years of experience now really thinking about how um, we can address that question of why people do what they do. And I'm largely informed by this idea of social psychology and pulled from methods and theories that are um, from social psychology, but I also do apply theories and methods from other disciplines as well. But why I would claim the kind of social psychology space is because it's ultimately interested in what the individual is doing within the context of groups. Um, as somebody with the kind of natural resource management, wildlife management background that I have, I'm also interested in the context of place and how that shapes who we are. 
So the, the work that I do um, is applied to management in kind of two primary ways. Um, certainly the impacts of decision making on different stakeholder groups and the audiences and kind of publics that we are serving as um, wildlife managers. And then also the preferences of those different audiences. So um, what are, you know, we can define preferences in a variety of ways and I'll get into some more examples throughout this talk. But just recognizing that when we think about the impacts on audiences and the interests and preferences of those audiences, that it ultimately indicates there's a relationship between the agencies and organizations and those audiences that they serve. So to further go into details about why, um, you know, in my space, in terms of social science, why I'm thinking about this context mattering in these dynamic systems is that, you know, often a lot of human dimensions research and certainly a history of human dimensions of fish and wildlife research is focused mostly at that individual level, but recognizing that we as humans are not operating in a vacuum, right? We're intimately connected with our social networks and relationships among families and peers um, whether those are through kind of our, um, whether we're on teams, for instance, or we're in some other group setting. Um, we're embedded within communities that have their own kind of norms and ethos and relationships among organizations. And then we are often, particularly in the context of, um, you know, management of natural resources, say fish and wildlife, we're also thinking about the organizations that are managing for those species and those places and habitats. So uh, there's informal rules within those organizations that shape um, the way in which that those organizations operate. And then there's, of course, the formal rules, which are more like the local, state, and federal <coughs> laws. So excuse me for a half. Okay. So just making the point here that in the context or because the context matters, it's really important to think about these different levels of measurement that shape that individual level behavior. And I apologize. Okay. So there's two projects in particular that I would like to focus on today. Um, they are embodiments of research programs, really. So, but I will refer to it as America's Wildlife Values as the first project, and then talk about the uh, Fish and Wildlife Service project on federal public lands in a minute here, or in a little bit here. So with the America's Wildlife Values project, um, this builds on additional projects that I was involved with starting in grad school at Colorado State University and continuing into my current position now as assistant professor at The Ohio State University. So with this project in the focus of what I'll talk about today, we are interested in um, wildlife value orientations and how that shapes what um, acceptability of different fish and wildlife management actions and there's a lot of other contexts in which this work applies, but I'll focus on um, human wildlife conflict specifically with the talk today. So, and I won't go into um, you know, a ton of detail on the methods, but I think it's important to highlight that we this was a replication of earlier work conducted in collaboration with those partners at Colorado State University. So the traditional male survey was because of that replication. So, you know, data were collected in the early 2000s, and then this project was in 2018 and 2019. So we did have to mimic that original approach to make sure that the methodology itself wasn't the cause of any sort of differences. But recognizing too, that obviously the context of, um, you know, the methodology itself has changed greatly in that last 15 years that we did um, supplement the data collection efforts through email panels to ensure that we had greater representation, particularly of younger audiences, as well as um, more racial and ethnic diversity. So certainly a quantitative approach, and there's geospatial applications of this work. So as you can see, we had over 40,000 people respond. So at the state level, we have at least 400 people um, representing each state. But in many cases, some of the states also had um, that better, or um, I would say better ge geographic resolution. So in the example of Washington, for instance, we had county level data as well. So residents of all counties being represented there. So, you know, this is a partnership with 50 state fish and wildlife agencies. So that's, you know, all across the nation there. So I want to give a little bit of background to you on some of the terms that I'm going to be using throughout this portion of the talk. 
Um, so thinking about values as these sort of core weighty beliefs that we apply in different cognitive domains or sort of cognitive lanes, if you will. So we use values to help um, try to predict a variety of different attitudes and behaviors as well. So obviously the number of behaviors are quite variable within these sort of cognitive lanes, but for the most part over time, we can start to see patterns in how those values are applied. But I do wanna be clear that values are much more immersive than just sort of bowling balls, if you will, right? Um, they are the cultural waters in which we swim. So values are deeply immersive and they literally help us to stay afloat um, in these complex social relationships that we have. So they are embedded in our laws and policies, they're embedded in our education system, um, they're embedded even in like religion and or the text that we're reading um, about how we should interact with others. So just knowing that again, values um, as a noun, but also values is almost a life way is an important aspect of thinking about how values work. So another term that I'll use in this portion of the talk is this idea of modernization. So it originally stemmed from thinking about the um, you know, multiple decades following World War II and the significant change that um, societal life in largely industrialized countries um, experienced. So the current context of how we might define modernization might look slightly different. Um, so I'm just, when I'm using this term, I'm largely thinking about um, how society has been shaped, particularly through these conditions of modernization. And that's, we're measuring that through um, some element of kind of societal increases in wealth, um, urbanization and education. And these conditions of modernization are really shaping the way that we move about the landscape, you know, where we get our food sources from, even how we learn about what appropriate relationships with wildlife might be. Um, we're even able to self-select, you know, what those kind of, um, information sources are in these particular contexts. So recognizing that those conditions of modernization are changing our social life, which then influences what our values are and then how we apply those values to those different cognitive domains. So I'll focus on kind of two key um, wildlife value orientations or values applied to wildlife. Um, and I do include fish and wildlife within this talk. So recognizing um, that in the US, the two primary value orientations that have been studied are domination and mutualism. And domination is primarily influenced by more of a hierarchical worldview. And so this is thinking about um, that humans and particularly humans and kind of, I don't mean me, my social network, but you know the, the individual who ascribes to this belief um, that the humans that are affiliated in their social network have priority over others. And in this case, we're applying that term of others to wild animals. And so, um, you know, simplifying what this looks like, that use of wildlife for an individual with a domination orientation is entirely appropriate when it helps to support the needs and interests of the people that are using those wildlife. So what can be perceived as in contrast to that domination wildlife value orientation is this idea of mutualism. And that is primarily influenced by a worldview of egalitarianism. And so that is seeing others as having you know, equal or of um, important needs and interests um, to those of humans. So in this case, the role of a wild animal or animals more broadly can be that there's a social affiliation that is derived from that relationship. And some of the types of behaviors or perceptions of what is appropriate behaviors can be in relation to this perception of care. So I do want to be careful because I recognize that, um, you know, you all may recall several years back where there was like the people who saw um, a bison in Yellowstone and thought it was looked cold and then put it in their car and brought it home to try to make sure that it was warmed up and all this stuff. So the um, actualization of the behavior is uh, due to a perception of what the appropriate behavior should be. It's not a determination of what is appropriate. So I just want to be clear that I'm not saying that it's necessarily the appropriate way of interacting. And certainly within my own work, I look at wildlife feeding, um, whether that's intentional or unintentional, and the, um, the potential that that can lead to obviously negative human wildlife interactions. 
So again, just thinking about how um, these different kind of behaviors and ways in which we engage with wild animals can potentially lead to problems for um, both species involved. So my point with this particular slide is giving information on the background of domination and mutualism. So I will talk about different types of people as well. Um, and this is primarily identifying like a traditionalist is one term that I will use. Um, and that person is classified as somebody who scores high on the domination orientation. So we do measure this through a variety of different survey items. Um, so it's not, you know, you have two choices and you just pick these two. I want to be careful on that. There's a number of different items that we're assessing the pattern of response across those items. And so traditionalists would be somebody who scores higher on the domination orientation and lower on that mutualism orientation. And then a mutualist would be somebody who scores high on mutualism, but low on that domination orientation. There are other types, but for the purpose of this talk, um, I'll focus on largely those two groups. So why does all of this matter? Um, obviously it has direct implications for fish and wildlife management. And so some of the um, type of work that I've been doing with colleagues of mine at Colorado State University and continuing on, um, so I'll go through a variety of examples here. With this particular image, um, we can start to see again sort of that cognitive plane or that pattern of um, relationship between values and individual kind of survey items that represent situations that an agency may face. So each kind of dot within this figure may represent, um, like the red squares in particular, um, represent some aspect of lethal control of um, primarily carnivores, technically bears fall into um, this grouping, but they're not necessarily strictly carnivores, obviously. Um, but in this case, it could be like a um, mountain lion that attacks a pet in the state of Arizona. So for residents of Arizona, if they scored higher on the domination orientation, they were less accepting of lethal control. And, or excuse me, they were more accepting of lethal control with the domination and orientation, but a mutualist or somebody who scored high on mutualism would be less accepting of lethal control. So you see that pattern across a variety of different items and the strength of that association obviously differs depending on the context, um, depends on the state and depends on like the species itself. So I do want to point out like the, the one kind of red square that looks like an outlier in the kind of upper right quadrant. Um, obviously the strength of that relationship is still on the pretty minimal side, um, but because it is different than the, um, you know, the other pattern, I wanted to point that out just because that was actually a case in Hawaii that was focused on removal of a non-native species to benefit a native species. And I think in some contexts that can apply when we're thinking about, um, you know, removal of pinnipeds that are affecting large salmon populations. So just thinking what, you know, there are contexts in which people are understand the trade-offs that are being made um, within the context of fish and wildlife management. So there's a variety of other patterns here. Um, essentially the upper left quadrant is showing positive relationships with mutualism and um, negative relationships with domination. And in the context of more collaboration with partners, um, some additional work that we've done um, indicates that that may be because some of those uh, traditional stakeholders may be concerned about the sort of equalization of different um, stakeholder input and maybe the kind of diminishing of their voice being heard. Um, so that's you know, related to some of this work that I've talked about in terms of backlash. So I don't really highlight that with this talk, but for folks who are interested in that particular um, vein of my research, I'd be happy to talk about it. So similar for each of those kind of individual dots, um, we obviously follow up with like, um, you know, regression to better understand what leads to those patterns that we're seeing. So this is just one example um, to take into account like any one of those dots. So this particular one was looking at um, you know, acceptance of lethal control of a wolf that kills livestock. And um, from you know, model one versus model two, we can see that the addition of the values, domination and mutualism, um, certainly helps us to better explain this model, right? Like demographics alone explain about 9% of the variance. 
versus about 26% of the variance once we add in values. And it's in the direction that we would you know, expect based on theory that the domination orientation um, that people are more accepting of removal of wolf in that situation and those with the mutualism orientation are less likely. So some of the work that I'm engaged with as well, um, I know this looks very busy, but the main point with this particular figure is that those indications of modernization that we talked about, so those um, higher income levels, higher education levels, and higher urbanization levels, there does appear at the state level to be relationships between um, an increase in mutualist with those indications of modernization and that you know, fewer traditionalists so, you know, I do want to be clear that this is, again, following a theoretical approach from, um, you know, looking at how society has changed across several decades. Um, certainly, we're in a certain you know, context now that is drastically changing how we interact um, and how we engage, including this virtual seminar. So recognizing um, that this is not expected to be like a linear relationship, right? Like we don't expect, you know, Montana to become Delaware or anything like that. The, the reason why this work becomes important is that it helps us to understand, um, you know, what, why the context of values is what it is in certain states and also how that may vary within a state as well. So to follow up to, um, I do, you know, contextual effects modeling or a type of multi-level modeling to look at um, what is the impact of that context on the individual above and beyond that individual's experience. So you can see like the individual level effects um, would be like a typical regression, um, you know, but in this context, we're not treating that context as separate from the individual. So we're able to look at, in this case, um, the place, in this case, it's counties within Washington state. So we see that if you were to live in a county with um, a higher degree of modernization as defined by theory, then you would see a decrease in those with the domination orientation and um, similarly an increase in those with the mutualism orientation. So again, just demonstrating some of the analytical techniques that I apply to better understand um, you know, what's happening on the landscape within the context of values, influence, or, um, what shapes our values, and then how our values shape attitudes towards different behaviors. So I just want to note for folks who may be familiar with this type of modeling, um, there's two numbers under this percent variance explained column. Um, the first number is how much variance we're explaining at the individual level versus the second number is how much we're explaining at that second level or the kind of county level in this case. So we are better at explaining the county level variance, um, but the, you know, with multi-level modeling for folks who are familiar with that, recognizing that um, there is more variation at the individual level. So even though we're better at explaining the group level, um, there's still a lot left to explain at that individual level. So that leads to some additional work that I do to better um, adapt those models. So one of the things that I think is really unique and um, well, so from the geospatial perspective, I get really excited about this kind of work because we can start to look at you know, how the different states vary and you know, what that means. So just quickly thinking about Washington at about 28% with this particular value type. Um, so it's one of those states where social conflict may actually be um, you know, a higher probability of having social conflict because there's a multitude of different value types. And certainly we can see how this one value type may differ across the state. So, you know, certainly there are some counties with a higher proportion of their residents um, over a majority that do have this one value type. So, you know, I mentioned there's other value types and be happy to talk about that, but I just wanted to give people a sense of the kind of lay of the land. And so when or how this can matter with these geospatial applications and that um, degree of resolution where we're represent are able to represent the different counties we can start to look at things like, how does that overlay with actual habitat, for instance, for say black bear? And what does that look like when we're thinking about, um, you know, the acceptability of a new, you know, acceptability of lethal control for a nuisance black bear? And um, so that's one that's getting into trash for, um, was the example that was provided. <clears throat> 
So the darker color means, you know, people are more accepting of lethal control for that particular scenario. So, and we do see that there's, you know, a relationship there between where acceptability is highest is not where bears um, should have primary habitat. You know, this being an overlay of, um, I, I believe it was ideal black bear habitat. I'm forgetting exactly where I had pulled that data from. I wanted to use this as an example to point out how we can overlay um, and think about how these social ecological systems operate. So we can think about, you know, black bear incidents, whether that's a call to the agency just because of the siting, um, or whether it's an actual kind of lethal removal by the state agency in the context of, um, you know, a problem bear. Um, so just thinking about different ways of how we can integrate these different sources of information. So at this point, I'm not um, trying to present this as like the only way it can be, but trying to present it as an opportunity for collaboration um, for those who do understand the ecological context and can partner um, with somebody like me on the social science side to think about how these different sources of information can be interwoven. So similarly, some of the work that I've been engaged with recently is thinking about um, how we can conceptualize this idea of intolerance. So where it can actually be anthropogenic resistance of humans on the landscape that may prevent um, wildlife movement. And so this particular case study example um, was looking at, so the, the data themselves are on the older side from an earlier project that I engaged with um, actually in 2009 with WDFW. So not again, representing the current context of wolf management, but just recognizing how we might apply these social science data with these types of frameworks. So the idea of intolerance, we conceptualize that as a combination of somebody who has you know, a particular value type um, and also has um, basically answered a number of questions in relation to attitudes that would indicate that they're, you know, in this case, um, unsupportive of wolves on the landscape um, and supportive of lethal control if the wolf gets in trouble or um, is involved in these sort of human wildlife um, interaction or conflict. So, and then if in addition to that, they're engaged in some degree of behavior, um, that if the human is engaged in some degree of behavior that may, um, you know, basically make it easier to um, prevent the wolf on the landscape. I, I want to be careful that it's not suggesting that everyone who engages in, for instance, as an example, hunting is going to apply that to the context of a wolf, because obviously that's unfair, recognizing that we have a diversity of hunters as well. Um, but for folks who have like never engaged in that activity, um, never engaged in any sort of activity that may, um, you know, re reduce the chances of a wolf continuing on that landscape and has a whole slew of certain values and attitudes, then that can conceptualize this idea of intolerance towards that species. And then we can start to look like where there may be um, kind of anthropogenic resistance to that wildlife movement on the landscape. And so, you know, right now it's a, you know, static visual, but we can start to think about how this might apply within the context of, say, like an agent-based model, um, thinking about how the species are moving about the landscape and how humans are moving about the landscape. <clears throat> so one of the projects, too, that I'm working with with um, one of my grad students is applying the same idea of looking at how values and, um, you know, I guess following up on my earlier point of recognizing that there's, it's, um, you know, there's a lot going on here. It's values, and in this case, we're looking also at identity um, in addition to place. So we're looking at kind of the intersection of um, identity within the place. So the two places here, um, NRM is Northern Rocky Mountains, and then WGL is the Western Great Lakes. Um, so thinking about how individuals who identify in a particular way and live in a particular place, are they, in this case, um, it was looking at attitudes towards wolves. So we can start to see that these um, kind of interpersonal factors if people identify with a particular type of group um, and how values, in addition to that identity and place, um, additionally add to how we explain um, what these attitudes are on the landscape. So we can see that each of these cognitive and interpersonal factors are additive into the models that we're using. 
Um, so one additional component to this project is something that I'm advancing now is also thinking about this um, Michelle Galfont's work and thinking about tightness and looseness of culture. So it's essentially looking at the kind of social fabric of that place. So thinking about the norms that are common within a community and then the ability to kind of sanction if those norms are violated. So some preliminary work that I've been doing in this area um, suggests that those that have the domination orientation or that are particularly typed as a traditionalist are the ones who um, most often see the kind of tightness looseness within their communities. So the um, one with the domination orientation, as an example, if they're around other traditionalists or other people with that same orientation, um, they perceive their communities as more tight. And then if they're around more mutualist, they see their community as more loose. But for the mutualist, um, it doesn't necessarily matter as much who they are around. So that may have implications for, um, you know, why values work a certain way in some places, and maybe they're not as good of predictors in other places because of that community dynamic. So in terms of the broader work with the American Wildlife Values Project and sort of that research program overall, um, some of the key findings for that particular work, um, obviously recognizing that context matters, um, where we currently live as well as how we were raised. Um, so that, that context in terms of shaping who we are can really be embedded by those experiences that we have at early ages. Um, and then the who we associate with in terms of thinking about identity, um, and all of that has an impact on our beliefs and actions. And that values in particular can help us to predict, you know, a whole slew of attitudes and behaviors. So they can help us to think about um, change on that landscape over time and start to uh, make predictions. You know, um, we can use things like census data and some other um, like the social values or additional sources of information on social explore that are available to us to start making predictive models about how the current context of change may be influencing us going forward. Um, we can also identify sources of potential social conflict among different user groups. And so that's stuff that we may be able to um, help circumvent if we know in advance that we may be going into certain circumstances that um, might be challenging from like a public um, engagement perspective. But also the spatially explicit data can predict hotspots hot spots for a variety of things. I gave some examples of how it might help with human wildlife conflict um, or thinking about acceptability of lethal control, but there's a variety of other kind of hotspot type analyses that we might be able to do with these data on the social science side as well. Um, just, you know, one example, thinking about even hunter recruitment and retention, um, so we can identify, you know, who maybe has recently dropped out, um, look at the landscape features of accessibility for those individuals, um, and think about, you know, how that might influence their ease of access to available places to engage in those activities. And then, you know, obviously informing systems approaches um, being pretty important here. So I do want to add um, some additional work that I'm doing with Fish and Wildlife Service. So this is a large scale project that builds on work that I did in partnership when I was actually an employee at USGS in Fort Collins, uh, Colorado. So currently conducting, well, right now we're on pause because of COVID, but when we weren't under COVID restrictions, we were conducting surveys um, or information collection from visitors on national wildlife refuges, about 35 refuges per year. And the idea is to um, do this on a five-year cycle so that we would have uh, currently collecting a baseline of information about refuges and their visitor experiences and expectations. And then we can see how that may change over time. Um, so looking at satisfaction levels, you know, demographics, um, how are our visitors, or do they represent the local communities? Um, are there additional uh, constituent groups that aren't visiting refuges that we can maybe better connect with going forward? So the methods for this, we do on-site contacts, but then we do follow up with the individual once they get home um, through a mail survey and people do have the option of completing the survey. So, we follow up with them by mail, but then they have the option of going online to complete the survey or um, completing a hard copy of that survey. 
And we actually get about a half of respondents completing it online versus half doing it by paper. So um, I point this out because there's some methodological um, interesting aspects with this particular project of how we engage with visitors on site. And one of the key reasons why we follow up with them in their home is because we are also looking at economic contributions to local economies. So if people were completing the survey while they were on site, but they haven't completed their trip, um, particularly for those non-local visitors, um, that could be an issue, right? Because we're not fully capturing how much they may be contributing to that local economy. So just I'll give kind of one example of this work. Um, a portion of this work was also informed by this idea of um, how do we help or how do we assess the beliefs of visitors in terms of ecosystem services? But one of the things that we know from um, additional social science work is that people typically um, understand and you know, kind of appreciate the ecosystem services that most directly benefit the recreation activity of interest to them. So like, you know, birders appreciate protection of habitat that supports the birds that they're interested in seeing. Um, so this makes sense, right? So going forward, we wanted to think about, you know, how might this look different in different places uh, for different refuges across the country? It's obviously highlighting some in Washington here, but this work really helps us to have that kind of refuge level information. We can aggregate up after this five-year cycle to understand the regional impacts of this work, and then also think about from the national perspective um, how this might play out. So I want to maybe kind of quickly walk through this visual. Um, here I'm building on work from some other folks who had applied this um, thinking to fisheries and thinking about how kind of climate change can impact um, inland fisheries. And this was specifically thinking about, um, you know, I guess one example, you know, of, uh, warmer waters change like fish distributions and that may change the impact on um, anglers who are seeking out opportunities to fish particular species. So building upon that work and thinking about what is the system in which kind of recreationists are engaging with um, certain species that are being managed, which is depicted here by this kind of first pathway. Um, obviously we're you know, governing or um, managing those species as well. So that can be in relation to, um, you know, well, a variety of different aspects. So we're, we're managing both the system itself, the species in that system, as well as um, say hunters, for instance, we're managing them through um, allowable take or through licensing and things like that. So the fourth pathway here is similar to the values work that I just presented. So there's elements of that social system that are impacting um, who engages in recreation and what kind of recreation they're engaging in. And then um, some of the work I do with the backlash stuff, right, is how the social system itself might also be influencing wildlife governance. So I, I just point out this figure of recognizing that these are system dynamics. And so when we're thinking about the ecosystem services part and how well our recreationists understand the importance of those ecosystem services, we have to also keep in mind um, that there's, you know, the kind of ecological side of this matters too. So we can collect social science information to help inform decision making, but it's one piece of a complex system here. So some of the items on the survey that we ask focuses on how people perceive their future recreation activity in relation to their primary activity. So if, if I'm filling out a survey and I primarily engaged in fishing, um, when I get to this a set of questions asking me about my future recreation activity in fishing, um, I can think about how these different things may impact my experience. You know, for some people, maybe my experience will remain the same. Um, but maybe if a particular sort of management lever um, is pulled, if you will, then maybe that would increase my future activity, right? Because I would really like for that thing to happen. On the converse side of that, of course, um, maybe there's things that we might do from a management perspective that might decrease recreation activity. So that would be you know, represented here by the, the blue kind of coloring. Um, Alone, these items aren't necessarily as helpful as they could be if we're thinking about it from the perspective of management, um, like a decision sciences management tool. 
So with this example, um, from, to answer that ecosystem services question, we see the first three bars where there's the highest proportion of green or people saying they would increase their recreation activity because of these things like improving wetland quality, um, improving habitats other than wetlands or increasing species diversity. So this is maybe not something that, you know, is immediately helpful for managers because that may not be something that they can necessarily do. And it doesn't tell us what the, for instance, like wetland quality actually is. So that's of course where like the ecological information would need to come into play too. What this does tell us is that um, our audiences that are recreationists on these federal public lands really value these things, right? So we can start to compare how that might differ if there were um, like less water in the, so if we were looking at reservoirs with a particular site um, or if drought was a particular issue due to changing climate variables. Um, if that you know, would certainly impact um, or could impact boating activities or could impact um, fishing or things like this. So, Again, with this visual, these data alone aren't necessarily helpful, but when we start thinking about the complexity of answering these management questions of like, okay, if I pull this sort of management lever, what might that subsequent effect be on different recreation populations? So for instance, I'm working now with some partners to develop a decision, um, a decision science tool that would help managers think about, you know, what those variables were on the x-axis, and now thinking about, okay, if we were to have more acreage open to hunting and fishing, if there was changes in regulations on those um, activities, maybe that would have a positive relationship for um, hunters and anglers and increase their activity. But maybe those same people also told me that crowding was an issue. And if there was crowding, that that would actually decrease their activity. So then we can start to kind of counterbalance that of like, is the um, you know, fallout effect, if you will, of making that decision actually counterproductive. Um, in this case, with this particular pathway, let's say that it most affected our non-local hunters and anglers, which then means we may be losing that revenue within the local economies. Um, and similarly, um, if we think about, you know, potentially benefiting hunters and anglers by addressing these interests, if that is of interest to them, does that have um, negative impacts on other recreational users? And what does that look like if we're thinking about economic contributions? So this is just one type of example of what this decision tool would enable um, managers to be thinking about. So just as a maybe kind of quickly another example um, if we're thinking about you know people who are seeking out refuge experiences to um, see wildlife or to you know watch birds maybe there's certain types of infrastructure that would help support them and maybe if it was you know um, wildlife blinds maybe that could also help hunters um, at a different time of year so maybe we also note that wildlife um, people who are observing wildlife and birds also are interested in renting recreational equipment, or maybe they're interested in more preferred programming that directly uh, meets their interest, especially for maybe our first time visitors, right? So again, similarly, uh, maybe that increases the number of people who engage in that same activity. And so that could potentially, again, have subsequent effects if we're thinking about our local and non-local visitors. So again, um, when we think about all of the items on the survey, or at least a large, um, if we're thinking about how the survey items connect to each other um, through this kind of decision support tool, it becomes a much more impactful way to think about the data collection effort. So now we can start to um, you know, imagine like, again, if we pull that sort of management lever, what might the potential consequences of that decision be for different audiences? And from a positive standpoint, right, if we're trying to um, increase visitation from particular audiences, then we can also look to see like what maybe some of their interests are and how um, if we, you know, do reach out and try to address the interests of those audiences, does it help, um, help, help meet their needs while not adversely impacting other recreationists? So essentially, you know, with thinking about this, we have multiple solutions that are available to us, but identifying what might be the best solution overall for the most groups of people or for those groups of people who maybe are the most marginalized, right? Can we help to support their needs and interests? 
So the role of social science and these kind of decision support tools are to help decision makers think about what the potential consequences could be, you know, prior to actually making the decision. So in terms of this work that I'm presented, obviously there's many, many opportunities to think about recreation preferences and how that may affect future recreation demand. Um, I know there's, so, you know, um, Dr. Spencer Wood at the Earth Lab at UW is also thinking about um, how social media itself might be able to um, estimate visitation across refuges. And some of the data that we have would be, um, I think, of interest to a partnership there. <laughs> So visitor use planning, um, transportation, this particular project is like a third funded by transportation. So thinking about um, how do we move people about these federal public lands? Um, how do we also support their access and interest in reducing climate change impacts? Um, so if we can think about alternative transportation or just different modes of transportation. Um, and certainly the economic impacts is a big one. Um, I hear quite a bit from, you know, federal public lands managers of how do we quantify those economic impacts of visitation to our local economies, um, and that being a really important aspect of the methods that we applied here. And then um, the methodology piece itself. So one of the things that happens in a fair amount of social science is we do these non-response checks to try to assess like from the people we haven't heard from, how they might differ from the people that we have heard from. So in this particular project, we actually ask um, all the people that we contact on site a short amount of questions on site. So if we don't end up hearing back from them later, then we can uh, more accurately assess like who's not responding um, rather than in the um, previous approaches, you know, we would send out a survey um, for example, if it's a 12-page survey, right, some people are like, oh, I don't have time for that. <laughs> but then they get a smaller card that may be more equivalent to like an angler survey card. And so they're like, oh, I'll fill that one out. It's only, you know, 10 questions. So then the difference there isn't necessarily a matter of response or not. It's just a matter of a different mode. So in this case, because we're asking those questions up front of everyone, we have the same mode across the board. So we can start to see when we do get the surveys back, um, how does that constituent group of survey respondents differ from those who didn't respond. So there's some really cool methodological aspects of this project too. But I want to more broadly state that the, you know, my attempt here of presenting at least two kind of main threads of my research is identifying that, you know, there's certainly there's plenty of opportunities to also better understand these integrated systems. And you know both those ecological and social dynamics. And you know my hope is that I'm bringing in the social science and you know, quantitative strengths here, but recognizing that because of that background that I have um, and the interests and partnerships that I build over time, that you know I think being able to work closely with ecologists on some of these challenges are important. And you know, ultimately, my, my main goal in doing the social science research and answering that question of why do humans do what they do um, is really ultimately so that all beings can thrive in these partnerships and relationships. So even when we don't always agree on things, but the process that we're developing and the relationships of trust that we're building um, help to ensure that even when those disagreements do exist, that um, again, there's opportunities to collaborate going forward. So, and you know, my sense is that there, the, the opportunities in Washington to really address these uh, variety of different interests and different ways of engaging with the natural resources in the state and beyond um, are just really important for, you know, the, the partnerships that I've had and the partnerships that I hope to develop. So I will largely close there and hope that the opportunity to answer some questions from you all, I'm looking forward to that. Thank you so much, Aaliyah. We are doing the virtual applause. <laughs> um, lots and lots of questions coming in. I'm really pleased to see um, a mix of attendees from across the university, the agency, and even some from outside the state. So that's great. So um, I'm just going to jump right in with some questions. Um, so um, if you have questions, folks look down at the bottom of your screen and you'll see Q&A. You can click on that and you'll be able to, answer, to ask a question there. And I will be getting these questions to Aliyah 
Um, so Laura Prue asked, um, the county level maps of values may be skewed by urban centers and overrepresent mutualists spatially, given there is a strong urban rural divide in this orientation. Could mapping be done at a finer resolution? Yeah, I mean, I, I certainly think so, and I would hope so. So the um, because we sampled within counties, I mean, I think in this context of Washington, that one's actually really, really important because you know, obviously, there if we were only doing it at the state level, um, I think it's like what more than fifty percent of the population is like just in King County or at least the three counties around um, Seattle. So recognizing if we were doing a state level population count, that would be, or a state level sample, that would be hugely problematic. Um, and that's why, um, why, you know, WDFW and our partnership is so interested in making sure that we are representing all of the counties. So we were sampling at that county level. Um, there's still going to be potentially some skewness within that as well, because if there are urban bases even within those counties, so. So yeah, to your point, um, you know, I have to be careful too, because there's obviously very large landowners in certain parts of the state too. So when we get down to too specific a geographic resolution, you know, we don't want to be like, oh, that's that one landowner with that 40,000 acre property. So, um, you know, there are GIS techniques, of course, to try to buffer for um, some of that, but some of the property owners, you know, we just can't get down to too fine of a resolution either, but very good point. Great, thank you. Um, Aaron Worsing um, asked, and you mentioned this, what are the other types, you know, of these value orientations aside from mutualists and traditionalists? Yeah, so the, you know, with any approach, there are some challenges and some limitations with that. So with this, um, we're looking at those who score um, across those items that we're asking. So again, there's a number of different items that we're asking. So we're looking at those who, um, depending on how they score in the domination orientation and that mutualism orientation. So if they score high on both of those, they can actually be typed out as a pluralist. Um, and that's somebody who is typically thinking about, you know, situationally contingent, um, you know, what are the context or the circumstances in which this situation happened? And, um, if a mountain lion was, you know, in somebody's backyard or whatever, did they, you know, what was the kind of preventative measures that maybe that homeowner did to try to reduce any sort of negative interactions. Um, so in that case, the pluralist may act like a traditionalist in some ways and may ask like act, excuse me, may act like a mutualist in other ways. Um, and then the one who or the person who would score low on both of those dimensions is typed as a distanced person. And you know, personally, I'm probably more concerned about the distanced group because all of the other three types are people who are connected to wildlife. Um, they're connected in different ways, and there's obviously potential for social conflict among those groups, but they're people who are committed and um, engaged in some way, versus that distanced group is the one who's like, okay, why are they disconnected? What can we do to help engage them? So, Great. So still, I would at least acknowledge that it's somewhat of a heuristic, right? And there's obviously some limitations to that approach, and there are different, there's you know, more values, um, I would say, that are out there. So this is just helping us to identify patterns. Great, that's really interesting about distanced. That's, yeah. that's really interesting. Um, okay, so Tim Quinn is um, asking, um, I was wondering if attempting to change people's values or attitudes, such as creating a mutualist from a traditionalist is part of your expertise or is it a major sub-discipline in human dimensions? Yeah, you know, I have to, sorry that I'm kind of laughing on that one. Um, I would push back on that because again, from my personal standpoint, I feel like, um, you know, the traditionalist, pluralist, and mutualist are all engaged in wildlife related matters. Um, and I, it's not my role to push, you know, any sort of belief on like what one person should be. And so I just, you know, like I'm, I'm more concerned about the distance and I would love to get them engaged. So in that sense, I'm, you know, I still fall into the camp of like wanting to <laughs> shift some people perhaps. Um, for the distance group, maybe that's because they have other priorities. And so they're, you know, balancing really complex lives. Um, or maybe there are cultural differences or maybe they're more urban areas and access is an issue. 
Um, but to that question of like, you know, turning a traditionalist to mutualist or any of that kind of stuff, um, I do hear that from, you know, definitely folks that are in the conservation world who are like, oh, you know, mutualists are the, the right category or whatever. Um, I feel like that's problematic because, again, some mutualists may engage in behaviors that are not good for wildlife, or they may also not kind of understand the context in which we have to manage for, um, I don't know, like, I'll, I'll go with the bighorn sheep example, you know, like, when I worked in Southern California, there was about, I think it was 60 to 65 sheep left in that particular mountain range. If a mountain lion came in and ended up being interested in those bighorn sheep, you know, you could have one mountain lion take out like, you know, 10 animals in a relatively small amount of time. So in that case, um, you know, I recognize personally the need to like manage for that context and, you know, use lethal removal for that species. But, you know, somebody who might be in um, a strong mutualist, maybe like, you know, no, you can't kill that animal at all. You can't kill that animal at all. And maybe think about, well, let's move it to a different place. But, you know, from a wildlife management standpoint, we also understand that you're just displacing the problem. You're not necessarily um, stopping it, I guess, from having happening. There, just, uh, you know, from my personal position, I recognize it's a really complex kind of management um, place that we're working in. And so... It's probably more of a long-winded answer than you might have expected, but. Oh, that's great, thank you. Um, okay, moving in a different direction. Beth Gardner is asking, um, she says, thanks for a great talk. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit, bit more about your statistical approaches. For example, what programs do you use for analyses? Do you do any geospatial analysis specifically? Yeah, so I do primarily work with SPSS, the School Package for Social Sciences. Um, you know, I have some basic background in R, um, and my students are primarily using that. So there has been some, I don't know, generational shift already. <laughs> um, so I recognize that. In terms of the spatial um, work, you know, I mean, I've done certainly spatial out of correlation, looking at relationships, um, you know, based on proximity and how does that impact and are there stronger relationships because of place versus, um, you know, just values and that kind of independent or that like county sometimes can be an unfair approximation of what's actually happening because most of us don't identify with our county. <laughs> So where that kind of, um, you know, county was helpful for us because there are additional sources of information that we can use at the county level to start making um, predictions through um, like, you know, spatial multi-level modeling as well, so. Great, thank you. Um, I really like this question from Autumn Most. I'm thinking of some indigenous cultures where hunting occurs regularly, but the worldview is one of equality and respect for all living beings. How do you incorporate these ways of knowing into this um, sort of spectrum of um, traditionalist to mutualist? Sure, and I think, yeah, I think, you know, I was already kind of thinking about that earlier because I, I do see the value orientation work as more of a heuristic and it helps us to understand some aspects. Um, does it help us to understand all nations and all peoples? Um, you know, there are some applications in certainly other countries. Um, I would, I, I agree that I think even the techniques that we use may not be appropriate for um, working with some indigenous populations, right? Where maybe there's a distrust um, and using a mail back survey is not appropriate, right? Because it's like, doesn't um, develop that sense of trust of like, you know, we actually are really interested in hearing your input. We really do want to fully understand um, that context. I could kind of loosely suggest that the pluralist category may apply, right? Where people understand, or not necessarily all pluralist, but that situationally contingent aspect or that, that understanding that there's um, complexity here, right? That we can take life, that, but that life also gives life through food and um, clothing or um, livelihoods. So in that sense, I mean, you know, maybe superficially it can work, but recognizing that I think if you were developing partnerships with Native peoples that we would need to be much more um, understanding through culturally responsive research practices. So. Great, thank you. Thanks so much. I just wanna take a minute here and recognize that it is, is one o'clock. Um, and I think I just wanna, you know, again, say thanks to Aaliyah. We do have a few more questions. Um, so if you're able to hang on for a few more, um, I'd be happy to 
um, go through them. If, is that okay? Are you able to? Okay. Yeah, yeah, I love that. So, and I, for anyone that does need to hop off, if you haven't already hopped off, you're certainly welcome to follow up with me by email. Um, or, you know, if we do have a chance to talk over the next couple of weeks too, or any point going forward, I'd certainly be happy to entertain any additional questions you have. But um, yeah, I, I enjoy the questions. I'd love to get to see you all too, but at least yeah. we can answer your questions. Thank you so much. Yeah, we'll just, we'll just uh, maybe just take a couple more minutes. Um, John Marslip asks, how do you use your assessment of attitudes to affect change in the problematic feeding of wildlife? Yeah, so the, it's interesting because there's a couple different ways that I would um, answer that. So, because this is a project that I didn't talk about, but one of the projects that I am involved with with the National Park Service is looking at how, um, basically what are the ways in which people might be engaged in feeding, whether it's intentional or unintentional in say campgrounds. So I would certainly say like the, the kind of attitude part is probably most important when we're thinking about intentional feeding because that's somebody who may have that sort of attraction to wildlife and they're, whether they're trying to get a good photo or they think that it's a care behavior and they're like, oh, it looks hungry or it's begging or whatever. <laughs> um, so again, the motivations for engaging that behavior are quite different than say unintentional feeding where it could actually just be a lack of knowledge about appropriate um, you know, food storage practices and stuff like that. So that's, you know, <clears throat> I'm in the camp where knowledge can be useful, but there are often, there's definitely circumstances where people have the knowledge and either ignore it or, you know, choose to engage in, um, you know, other behaviors. So I would define whether it's intentional versus unintentional feeding, um, you know, and then like, what is the context in which it's occurring um, with visitors to say national parks? Um, that one would be more challenging than say at the home front where there's kind of a longer relationship with that place um, versus if you're a visitor, we know that um, a lot of our visitors think they're on, you know, they are on vacation and so they kind of start to like, oh, rules don't really apply to me and so they don't, you know, and if all the signage in that place also says like, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, and all they hear is no, they kind of start to tune out some of those messages that may actually be in their best interest to be reading. So there's, there's a lot, I guess, behind what my answer would be for that question. Um, certainly, I'd be happy to talk with you more about it. Great, so. thank you. Let's just do maybe one more. Um, and I see that Dan Holland asked this a little while ago, so I'm going to go to this question. It's also very um, much of interest here in Washington. Has your research explored attitudes towards conservation practices that involve negative impacts on some species to benefit others? And um, specifically, he calls out a, a big issue in Washington, which is culling sea lions to protect endangered salmon. Yeah, and that, I mean, I, I totally hear that. And that's, um, there, so some practices, yes. I mean, there's certainly trade-offs that occur and there are people who recognize those trade-offs and honor that. Um, so even like that Hawaii example that I gave early on where it was um, removal of, I think that was specifically non-native species to benefit a native species. So, you know, maybe there's a nativism there that's playing in, but, um, you know, you do see that like the, traditionalist person, you know, even though they do tend to be accepting of lethal control in general, they're, they, um, they also are like more accepting when it may benefit, um, I don't know, like if it were, the carnivore one is a pretty decent example for them in the case, because if, if they were engaged also in hunting activities, because the um, recipient, I guess, of the benefit of removing the carnivore may be that the prey species um, is perceived as going to increase with less carnivores. You know, obviously as managers, we know it's not that simple. Um, and there's additional consequences of over browsing from elk or um, agricultural damage from deer if, um, you know, if they're not moving around the landscape. <laughs> so um, in that, the part of the question I guess I would like to address is recognizing that we can start to see of like who, who recognizes that trade-off um, because we can compare what the response is to um, lethal control in general um, or lethal control in these sort of trade-off scenarios. And then we can start to see like who, you know, who is it that is understanding of that trade-off and how might we uh, communicate better with them because we, so in social science, you can also see that there's kind of social influence 
So if there's individuals who are sort of that do understand that trade off and are willing to kind of help be a messenger within their community groups, um, that might be more effective than say like even the agency being the messenger right so so that's I think the part of like understanding who those individual and I don't mean necessarily the name but like what are the kind of types of people that might fit and then how do we work with those um, partner agencies or partner organizations or partner um, even community groups to help get the word out about why that um, yeah, why, why we're managing in this particular way is to um, balance out for this. I think even how we communicate about that balance is important, so. Great, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, there's, a, there's more great questions. I'm sorry, everyone, we didn't get to all of them, but um, obviously lots of, lots of interest in this work. Um, so I just wanna thank you again, Aaliyah, for joining in, us in this, you know, continuing continually weird, um, sort of slightly unnatural setting, but um, really appreciate you taking the time to chat with us today. Um, and thank you to everyone who joined us, um, really appreciate it. And um, yes, we're getting lots of thank yous in the, uh, in the chat. Thank you very much. Great. All right, we'll sign off now. Have a great day, everyone. Thanks.